you roll it. Well, thank you. Uh, welcome to Lafayette. I don't know if you've ever been to Lafayette, Louisiana before. <laughs> no, I haven't. So uh, it's good to be here. Right. Certainly good to be here in the uh, context of uh, your exhibition. Right. Uh, I'm excited to have you here, here at the Hilliard Museum for Vanishing Black Bars and Lounges. Uh, it's just an honor to have you here. And, uh, you know, obviously I've been a fan of your work for a long time. And uh, the first series that I was introduced to was Harlem, USA. Can you tell me a little bit about how it came about and your relationship to that uh, place? Well, I was a very young man when <laughs> I started those photographs. Uh, it was, in fact, the first uh, project that I uh, started when I began to think seriously about what my subject matter would be uh, as a photographer. Um, the work and the experience of making the work came out of two different things. One of those things was the experience of uh, going to the Metropolitan Museum of Art when I was 16 years old. Uh, first time I'd ever been to a museum exhibition on my own to see the exhibition Harlem on my mind, which turned out to be a very uh, controversial exhibition. It was an exhibition about Harlem from the turn of the century up to 1968, and the show opened in 1969. And of course, 1968-1969 was a very tumultuous moment in uh, American social and cultural history. You know, the Vietnam War was raging, the Black Power movement had started, the women's movement. So there was a lot of what you might call this uh, tendency to speak back to institutions in power of all kinds, and that was true of the museum as well. So the Metropolitan Museum of Art got a lot of pushback for this exhibition that purported to be about Harlem that actually did not have substantial input uh, from the Harlem community, an exhibition about a community who did not feel that they had uh, sufficient uh, voice in the construct of the exhibition. So that's one part of uh, the Harlem uh, USA history, was going to see that exhibition at a very formative uh, age. I had just gotten my first camera the year before and had no idea what I was going to do with this camera that I had gotten from my godmother. Um, that exhibition began to give me a sense of what I might do with the camera. The other piece of it was that I had a family history in Harlem. My mother and father had actually lived in Harlem. They met in Harlem. Uh, only moving out of Harlem uh, when I was born. But even when I was a kid, there were a number of uh, family and family friends who still lived in Harlem. So we used to visit Harlem uh, periodically, but I never lived there. So when I started thinking more deeply years after seeing the Harlem on my mind exhibition about what the subject of my first project could be, I was kind of inextricably drawn back to Harlem, a place that I had a deep family connection to where I had never lived, to attempt to go back, so to speak, and to explore this place and to make pictures of this place that had been so much a part of my family's history through my mother and father. So it was a kind of personal 
homecoming, in a sense. And also, I wanted to contribute something to the long history of the ways in which that particular story community had been uh, visualized and represented. I was certainly acutely aware of uh, the larger socio-cultural history of Harlem, going back to the Harlem Renaissance, um, just the Harlem of the imagination, uh, a place of uh, rich cultural significance. Uh, I wanted to add something to that historical conversation through my own work. And it was also important when, after five years, I completed that work, I wanted to exhibit that work in the community in which the work had been made, because that was one of the controversies about the Harlem on My Mind exhibition. It was about Harlem, but it was in a museum downtown, so to speak, that was not immediately accessible to the Harlem community itself. Uh, and that's what led me to approach the Studio Museum in Harlem uh, about having an exhibition of the work there so that people who were the subjects of the work could also be considered as part of the audience for the work as well. Um, that project became my first exhibition. But it made me acutely aware of uh, the museum space, mm -hmm. the relationship between the museum and the community, and how one could use the idea of presentation within the museum to kind of bridge you know, that gulf that exists sometimes between museums and the communities in which they're situated by collapsing the two, by bringing the subjects in that community into the space of the museum to my own exhibition. So that's where Harlem, USA uh, began. Were you considering any other ideas at the time, or that one came to you and you knew it was it? Well, that was pretty much uh, the only idea I had. I mean, before that, I was just walking around making pictures that didn't necessarily have a relationship to each other. Uh, working on that project in one community allowed me to both continue making work that I thought was a significant contribution to the larger history of not only Harlem, but uh, the representation of black urban communities. But it gave me a subject around which to continue to refine my picture making mm -hmm. uh, as well. So it really began to uh, allow me to shape the discipline and the rigor of staying in one place and making photographs about that place and trying to dig deeper into that place rather than photographing uh, far and wide. Got it. Now, in addition to wanting to uh, contribute to the conversation, uh, a reframing of how the community was viewed, did you have a point of view uh, did you know Harlem was changing? Did you, did you see that? Or it was more about the reframing? Did you have any other uh, a, a thesis that you were, or an artist statement that you were trying to, uh, you know, contend with or excavate? Well, it's interesting because the years that I made those photographs, in Harlem were very difficult economic times for New York in general, which means that the 
economic difficulty were even more deeply felt in a, in a black urban community like Harlem. So that was present, but there was also the vibrant lives of the individuals that were present in the community as well. And because I was aware of the fact that Harlem had very often been visualized and described through the lens of various kinds of social pathologies, I very particularly did not want to make photographs that supported that particular narrative. Because one can go into any situation and find a number of different stories. It's just what's the story that you want to tell or what's the story that you feel is important to tell in addition to those stories that already existed. So I didn't have a sense of uh, the changing moment, but as I continued to visit Harlem uh, over the years after I completed that project, uh, Harlem began to go through successive periods and waves of gentrification. Uh, and I was acutely aware of that, even as I was working on other projects uh, that were not specifically about that community. But it took a while, I mean, almost 40 years later, uh, having continually visited Harlem and seen wave after wave after wave of uh, gentrification, uh, I decided that I needed to make some work about that, about this, uh, how the uh, physical and the social and the demographic landscape of Harlem was changing through gentrification and through the influx of global capital <laughs> into that community. And so I think it was in 2007 that I started going uh, to Harlem intentionally looking to describe the ways in which the community was changing from the community that I knew and had been photographing inside of in the 1970s and then what it was now clearly becoming uh, in the 2000s, uh, both in terms of uh, the disappearance of certain significant cultural landmarks in that community, like the Lennox Lounge, which had been uh, a club that uh, major jazz musicians performed in, uh, I would say right up until the late 90s, because I remember going there just before the 2000s, and maybe the early 2000s. Uh, and then suddenly Lennox Lounge was closed. Suddenly the building that had been the Renaissance Ballroom was torn down. And there started to be uh, what I came to call these spaces where something used to be. And what I felt was happening through this kind of erasure was this kind of erasure of culture, but also an erasure of memory. Because I was startled one day when I went to Harlem and I looked at this empty space where something had been previously and I felt torn because I couldn't remember what had been there. You know, there's this erasure and this disruption of place memory 
And I also realized that for the new demographic that was moving into Harlem, that memory did not exist. So I wanted to make work that was about that tension, you know, as it was happening, not to come back and photograph the aftermath of this new Harlem. And I also didn't want to make portraits, hmm. which I had been making up to that point. I wanted to shift my subject and my uh, vocabulary and start looking at uh, the narrative of space and place. And I worked on that project uh, for several years, and that became uh, a project that I called Harlem Redux, Harlem Again, mm. We're going back to Harlem. Um, it's clearly not the Harlem of 1975, 6, 78 uh, that I had photographed and previously. Those, those earlier photographs are also black and white. Mm -hmm. They're very classic black and white photographs because that was the language of so-called fine art photography at that moment. Uh, small black and white prints, uh, Harlem Redux, they're large, they're color, uh, they're a much more contemporary kind of photographic object. And because it was happening now, I wanted it to be color. Mm -hmm. I didn't want any of the nostalgia that can cling to a black and white photograph to inhabit that work. I, I wanted to have the bright color urgency of this particular moment. Mm -hmm. I think about with, with my project, sometimes I consider going to uh, places that existed, but they're not there anymore. And sometimes I think about shooting that in black and white, uh, like a, a reference to the past, uh, non-existent. Um, but the, I can see like parallels between your body of work, both bodies of work and mine. And it's interesting that within my series, Vanish and Black Bars, some of the changes are happening much more rapidly. It's like, it's almost as, almost as if I'm doing both projects at the same time. Hmm. Um, Interesting. Right. Interesting. Uh, and the past and the present correct. simultaneously. Correct. And perhaps it's the future. Correct. Black bars. Correct. I mean, because you have black bars that were open as recently as 2017. I'm um, thinking about one called Next Stop on St. Bernard Avenue. And when you try to uh, research it, you won't find anything. Maybe a Yelp page that says it's shuttered, you know, permanently closed. There is a place there now, a bar there now. And it's like really devoid of its past history. It's just devoid of blackness. It's devoid of any of the cultural uh, traditions that we're known for in New Orleans, uh, be it black masking Indians or uh, social aid and pleasure clubs. So I, I really look at it as an act of violence when these places shift so much as far as what they were and what they are. And it's really a missed opportunity uh, that it had been documented before. So is that what led you to the project? The, the absence of documentation about black bars, the changing situation with black bars. What, what led you to the Black Bar Project? And what were you working on leading up to that project? Um, what led me to it? Well, I was, I had become aware of like Roy De Carava's work. So someone who's documenting one thing, uh, well, he, do, he documented several things, but his work, his relationship to Harlem and more specifically, Bernie Ives' work. I uh, was exposed to his book, Juke Joints, probably sometime in graduate school, and I thought to myself, like, oh, wow, you know, I have this, we don't have Juke Joints in New Orleans, but we have black bars. So the place I would go to, the first black bar I went to was uh, called The Winner's Circle, W-I-N-N-A-H apostrophe S. <laughs> Had you been there before? 
No, I, I hadn't been there before. Uh, it was open from 1990 to 1999, and I would go with my sister. Her dad played there, Richwell Ice and Kirk Ford, but my sister was a vocalist. And my mother, before that, uh, she managed bands. She managed this R&B band. So once my sister, once my mother found out my sister could sing, she started being in the clubs. Uh, and I guess occasionally they would drag me along with her. Uh, so that's the first time I went into a black bar. And then I remember being about 17, 16, and uh, I was, like you, uh, a serious musician. And uh, when Marcellus was playing at the Jazz Fest in 1995, and usually he would have a jam session afterwards. So this time it was at Little People's Place because Kermit Reference was playing there. So uh, I brought my horn, <laughs> I sat in, you know, I, I eked out a few notes. You were, you were a trumpet player. I was you? a trumpet player, yeah. <laughs> the funny thing is, uh, you know, Wet Marcellus, he played these Monet trumpets, so it was really, really heavy. And after a while, he got tired of holding his horn. And he said, you know, can I borrow your horn? And I, you know, of course you're going to tell Wynn Marcellus yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, at some point, this musician kind of grabbed me. Not a musician, just a patron. It was a real small place. And he was like, hey, I bet you ain't never heard your horn sound like that before. <laughs> <laughs> it was true. I mean, you know, this guy's a master. But that was, so it's like increments, uh, various phases, and then, Sometime, I don't think I went to Black Bar as much during college and graduate school. I know not in graduate school. Uh, I just had started eating high off the hog, I guess one would say, and started liking uh, high-end cocktails. But it was when I came back to New Orleans and started teaching, and I was working with a lot of black women, and uh, we just started going to Black Bars. Uh, we watched Saints games there. Uh, Kermit Ruffins, if you went to one of his bars, uh, he had Sydney Saloon. He was always cooking free food. He does that now. I'm, I'm talking about good food. Uh, red beans and rice, but uh, coon, macaroni and cheese. I mean, like a meal. Real food. Real food. Um, <laughs> and so I kept going. I, I didn't really stop. There wasn't an interruption since about 2008. Uh, but then around 2017, there's this stretch of land on St. Bernard Avenue, uh, really close to the French Quarter, but it's a, it's a black neighborhood, the Seventh Ward of New Orleans. Uh, it's, a long, it's a long history of blackness in that area. Uh, and they had about seven or eight black bars on that street. And one day I realized that uh, all the black bars on that street except one had turned white. Uh, and then it's- How a, long did it take for that to happen? It, it felt like overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, it felt like overnight, but I would say I noticed it maybe within six months. Why? Uh, I mean, because you, you think a lot, of, a lot of bars typically run by like older people. Uh, older people, they don't always want to pass the bar down. Maybe if they have kids, the kids are not interested, especially if they've done well. It's almost like uh, being a laborer. Sometimes the brick mason or the butcher doesn't want his son or his daughter to do that type of work. Some people do, uh, but sometimes you want, want them to go to college and presumably have an easier life than you did. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the bars don't get passed down because of that. It's like they don't have succession plans. Um, so, you know, people probably of similar age uh, kind of retiring at the same time and selling the bars. Uh, so that's, that's when I noticed it, and to be honest with you, it just, it just really pissed me off. And that's when I embarked on a project uh, really early, January of 2018. And uh, since then, two of the bars that I documented, uh, Purple Rain Bar uh, in Central City, as well as the Sandpiper Lounge, which is, uh, probably was about 60 years old, they have both shuttered. And, uh, you know, what, what would you say uh, disappears when black bars disappear? Because I think, and I ask that because I think, uh, I think of black bars uh, kind of like the way I think of uh, black barbershops. Mm -hmm. They're not just the barbershops. Not at all. 
you know. Yeah. And black bars are not just bars. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what would you say disappears? What do we lose when a black bar shudders? You lose a safe space, number one, because these institutions were created when you couldn't get a drink anywhere else but in your neighborhood. You couldn't go to Bourbon Street. You couldn't drink at a white bar. Probably know what you want to. Uh, so we have these black spaces dating back to the late 1800s in New Orleans. Uh, Economy Hall was a black space like that. Uh, but more contemporarily, uh, you lose community. You, you lose the familiar people that, the regulars, the patrons. That's, that's one thing you lose. In New Orleans, you lose culture because a lot of the uh, black masking Indians, as well as the social aid and pleasure clubs, uh, they come out of bars, or they, you have Indian practice at a black bar. Uh, on, our, on our second lines with, with the social aid and pleasure clubs, they meander through the streets for four hours, but they make a stop at a black bar. They're going to kind of take a break, get a drink, uh, get some food, and then you, know, you come back out to black bar, you have the crowd of people of the city awaiting them, and they come out, beautiful regalia, uh, and you lose that. I've gone to uh, a few second lines this year, and you have this route sheet. So they're going to tell you where you start. This is the social aid pleasure clubs. You have a route sheet, and they'll tell you where you start, what street they're going down, and what stops they're going to make. So they had uh, Sandpiper Lounge, uh, and they stopped there. But because it was shuttered, they just truly stopped. I guess it was wow. paying an homage there, but they didn't go inside the bar. Uh, they passed out a little food and drinks outside. And I think that, you know, black folk, we could be so resilient. We could be like water where it's ever changing. It, it doesn't really stop. It has a misdirection. And I think that's a great thing. But to our detriment is that because we're so resilient in a way, we just kind of kept it moving. Like truly, we went on to the next stop. But to sit and think about this space is not our space anymore. This institution is not our institution anymore. And that, it was, it was hurtful for me to see. Um, so those are the things that you lose. And then secondly, um, I think about a place like Sportsman's Corner on 2nd and Dryads. Uh, we call it 2nd and D. Uh, that's the epicenter of uh, cultural traditions in New Orleans. So second lines of black masculine Indians stop there. And on certain nights, uh, or one night, St. Joseph night, that's where everyone congregates. In Mardi Gras Day, all the uptown Indians and downtown Indians, that's where they congregate. Now, God forbid that place, even though it's in its third generation of ownership in a, within the L.Y. family, it's, so it's an aberration that it's been through three generations. God forbid that something happens and they do decide to sell the bar. Those cultural traditions traditions are in a tepid existence because just like uh, the drumming, the African drumming in, in Harlem or uh, it, it became a nuisance, just like um, the go-go uh, music playing in DC became a nuisance, yeah. so too could our traditions become a nuisance. If the neighborhood changes too much, like, hey, y'all got to move because you don't have any stronghold to the land anymore. And then the neighborhood has changed so much around you. So it's terrifying for me to think yeah. about it that way. Yeah, and it definitely, uh, you know, that idea of uh, the kind of cultural disruption yes. that takes place as a new demographic kind of overtakes uh, a once uh, black community uh, you mentioned the drumming in Harlem, uh, and I think there's certainly a parallel there because, you know, I, I used to be a drummer, mm -hmm. and I used to drum in all of those parks, uh, Marcus Garvey Park in Harlem, uh, and then in, in Brooklyn, Prospect Park, and then also on Sundays sometimes in Central Park at the Bethesda Fountain. And those were all cultural centers, and people knew when to show up 
to join with members, uh, other folks in your community around the culture and the ritual of music. And one of the first things that happened uh, was that in Central Park, uh, the entrance to the fountain where drummers used to play is very close to Central Park West, which has never not been a wealthy neighborhood. But apparently it got wealthier. And apparently there was a new demographic living on Central Park West. And they started complaining about the drumming at the fountain, which had been going on at least since 1967. You know, I probably started hanging out there in 1969, 70, 71. Uh, and one day uh, in Central Park, several police wagons swooped in and just started taking in the drummers drums and throwing them in back of the police trucks, confiscating instruments in response to increasing complaints from the shifting demographics in the community. Absolutely just, you know, a huge violation to take a musician's instrument and to toss it in the back of a truck. Uh, and then that was followed a few years later. Uh, Marcus Garvey Park used to be a major center for the gathering of uh, traditional African drummers. And around Marcus Garvey Park continued to become gentrified. It was actually on one of those blocks that the first $2.5 million uh, brownstone was sold in Harlem. And the neighborhood around the park began to change. And the people who were now living there started to complain about what one of them called on a neighborhood site that damn jungle music. Uh, they moved from someplace quiet to Harlem where this tradition had been going on again at least since 1966, 67, and started complaining about this jungle music. Uh, and if you call the police enough time, they have to respond. Uh, and it turns out that uh, someone filed a complaint that the drummers were violating uh, some obscure, very old noise ordinance. I mean, a noise ordinance in New York City? I mean, whoever heard of such a thing? Right. But uh, they complained, uh, like I said, if you complain enough and call the police enough, they're going to have to do something just so they stop getting called, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. And so they decided to move the drum circle. We, we didn't even call it drum circle back then. It was just the place where drummers gathered. They, in response to these complaints, they put the drum circle in a designated area behind this huge boulder in the park and put an official sign designating this as the place for drumming between the hours of such and such and such and such. So of course, no, no more drumming till sundown. Mm -hmm. So this idea about uh, cultural disruption that begins to uh, take place in various black communities and the demographic uh, within that community shifts it is profound because they are so long standing that we think of them as traditions. And, and traditions, as we traditionally think about them, are things that endure. So when those traditions are disrupted and then disappear, it, it's, it's a very uh, significantly impactful thing on the culture, right. you know, and I think it's uh, 
you know, what you're doing with the black bar photographs and what I did with uh, Harlem Redux is to bring that into a contemporary conversation through our work to call attention to these shifting socio-cultural dynamics that are taking place that may or may not be remarked on, but you know, that we feel uh, compelled to visualize. Mm -hmm. well, <clears throat> particularly with Harlem USA, um, when did you know you had something? Uh, for me, I knew I had something. Um, uh, uh, a woman I know, Tina Antonini, I think that's how you pronounce her last name, uh, she was an editor for Pop-Up Magazine, so she asked me for some pictures. And I gave her like three or four, but it was the, it was the Black Bars one that she really resonated with. So I had to go out pretty much immediately because I had like a deadline from January to February to get it together. But then I, I, I worked on the project and then it got reviewed. You know, someone commented on it like that because it was Papa Magazine. They have your photos behind you. They have music playing, a uh, live band, but you're, you're reading and it's, it's entertainment, you know. Um, but then somewhere in 2018, Allison Glenn had a show, uh, Constructing the Break. She was a, like a guest curator at the CAC, and that's the photos that she picked. I, I remember you saw that show too. So for you, at what point in the process of you making the photos did you know you had something and it gave you confidence to go to the Studio Museum of Harlem to present the work? Um, I've always worked, I think, very intentionally mm -hmm. because once I started uh, working on the Harlem photographs, uh, maybe casually I might have made some other photographs someplace, but nothing mattered to me at that point other than getting back to Harlem again so I can keep working, you know. Making those pictures was synonymous mm -hmm. for me with making the work. Mm -hmm. If I wasn't there, I wasn't making the work. And I was young enough uh, when I started that work. Uh, my cost of living was very low. Uh, when I started, it was non-existent. Uh, I think I was 19 years old when I started that work, so I was still living at home. Uh, set up my first dark room in my mother's kitchen, if you can believe that. She let me use her kitchen as a temporary dark room mm -hmm. uh, with the promise that I would clean up and spray some air freshener <laughs> before everyone woke up in the morning and huh. you know, she wouldn't smell anything. Uh, but I was, I was very intentional uh, when I started that work. And when I started to think about where I might show that work. By then, I had been spending a lot of time at Studio Museum in Harlem. Uh, by that time, I had met Frank Stewart at the Studio Museum in Harlem. I had met Jules Allen. Uh, Carrie Mae Reams had started coming to Studio Museum in Harlem. Studio Museum in Harlem was the center uh, of our community at that point, the place where you went to find other people like yourself. Uh, and uh, there didn't seem to be that many other options at that point for where I could show the work. Uh, I didn't know any place else to go where I would be welcome to show that work. So when I had what I thought was a sufficient number of pictures for an exhibition. Maybe I had 35 of them that I really liked. I had obviously made a lot more. But when I had those 35 pictures, I, uh, I approached the curator at the Studio Museum in Harlem, who by then I knew well. Uh, I had actually taught a class at Studio Museum in Harlem uh, by that time. Uh, they had a number of uh, classes, photography, filmmaking, dance. And so I had a sense 
from having seen other photographers' works. And by then I had gone out and started looking at a lot of photographs. I had a sense that I had a good, strong group of pictures. I, I was very self-critical. Uh, so I thought I was ready to uh, show them. And so at that point, I approached the museum. I was wondering, you know, uh, because you asked about uh, approaching Studio Museum in Harlem, when I finished the work, at what point I knew uh, I had enough work to uh, approach them with. I'm wondering for your black bars pictures. Uh, we're sitting in the midst of an exhibition of this work in a museum, uh, which makes me wonder, where did you first start showing or publishing the black bar pictures? How did these pictures come to be uh, first known? How did they first find an audience? And how did they go from that to being in a museum setting? First, it was like I said, uh, it was with the pop-up magazine. I showed them there, but it wasn't permanent. Uh, they don't even record the show. So it's like, you see it, and that's it. Uh, then shortly thereafter, well, uh, I had a show at, um, I had a show, I had a show at Noma. Very different work. It was work I call Constructed Realities. Uh, so that was called Change of Course. So it was about uh, students who had this uh, nonviolent coup d'etat and everything staged. But uh, the show was a pretty big show. It was uh, 11 images for me. And when you walk in, you see this big banner, and uh, it was like the lead image of the show. I remember that show. Right. So I was feeling real good about myself, you know? <laughs> and uh, I remember Allison Glenn was at my studio, and I was like, well, should I enter your show? Because it's an open call show. Like, surely I'm beyond open calls now. And she was like, you better enter this show. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I find it that any time I get my ego out of the way, good things happen. And then I, I just continued to work on it. And then I, the next significant showing came with uh, Kalolo Luckett. Uh, she's a, she was a curator uh, at the August Wilson Center in Pittsburgh. I probably mm -hmm. butchered the name. It's a longer name than that. Uh, but she called me because someone, she had a show lined up. And that person dropped out the, uh, for various reasons. So she needed a show quickly. And I was telling her about my different bodies of work, and she's like, let's roll with the black bars. Let's roll with that. And uh, then that was about 35 images in Pittsburgh. So that was, a, at the time, the biggest uh, production of my work. And I think, uh, in tandem with that, I had engaged with the New York Times. Um, I met a guy named Richard Fawcett at Leah Chase's funeral. Uh, and he, I had interviewed him one time because of uh, my work with the Bitter Southerner, but he thought we met in person and we didn't. And then he, you know, he was asking, like I guess most writers or creatives do, like, what, what have you been working on? What are you working on? And uh, I told him about the Black Bars Project. And he said, uh, do you have an agent? I was like, no. And he was like, do you want a book? I was like, yeah. And he said that, uh, well, uh, would you let me write about it? Uh, I was like, hell yeah. He was like, because I think you'll get all those things. And as news happens, the breaking news take precedence over things that are more evergreen. So it just it didn't seem like it was going to happen. And uh, I went to dinner one day with some of my mentors from NABJ, uh, Akili Ramsey in particular. And then it was three other black women at this dinner. Everyone were editors, photo editors, uh, and three of them worked for the New York Times. Uh, one woman, Chandra Stevenson, she was asking me, like, what you been working on? What are you up to? And I told her about the Black Bars Project and that I had been talking to Richard Fawcett. The next day, she emailed Richard Fawcett and her editor and just got it rolling. Basically, she was like, if you're not going to use this story, I want to. Um, and then I started going back and shooting pictures again. And then it hit another law. 
And Richard called one day and he said, hey man, um, I'm not gonna be able to write this, but won't you write it? And I think he heard like the disappointment uh, and he followed it up quickly with, but you're gonna get two bylines, writing and photography. And you know this story really well. But initially, my disappointment was the ego again, like, like, oh, wow, someone's going to write about me for the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> but he helped me reframe that. And again, anytime I put, I don't have, I'm not like an egotistical person, but anytime you put it aside, good things happen. So that New York Times story and the exhibition in Pittsburgh pretty much lined up at the same time. And, uh, that was right before the pandemic. So we had a, a wonderful Mardi Gras. It was also in Crystal Bridges at the same time. So it was just like one thing after the, the other with the Vanshee Black Bar series that just lined up well. And um, then this show happened because, uh, and we'll bring him on and talk to him pretty soon, Benjamin Hickey, the curator here. Uh, I think I, I knew him from, I think, Vita Shell a guy I went to graduate school with. And you know, sometimes you have relationships that you, you start, but nothing professionally materializes for a while. But you have that relationship and you just keep in contact with people and then something happens. So uh, this has been a very gratifying experience. One, really just giving a voice to a subject uh, that have been overlooked. And I, I, for the life of me, I can't understand why. We have so many brilliant photographers in New Orleans, so many, at, at one point, so many black bars, and black folk and, and other photographers, Michael P. Smith, uh, Chandra uh, uh, McCormick, and Keith Calhoun, I, I've seen them go into black bars and do the work, but no one, uh, like you said with your project, just very intentionally focused on that one subject. And that's the thing that I've been, off, been able to offer to the conversation. And something else about this particular exhibition, uh, not all of the photographs in this exhibition are yours. You've yeah, actually yeah. curated a selection right. of other photographers' works including two of my Harlem USA photographs. Indeed. Uh, you have Carrie Mae Reams, Roy DeCarabo, you have one of mine, several other photographers. What do those photographs mean in the context of this exhibition? And maybe uh, an easier way to ask it is, why are those photographs in this exhibition? What do they mean to you in relation to your own work and maybe in relation to the Black Bar series? Well, some of that I think Benjamin's going to answer. Uh, but some of it, he, he asked me, who are my influences? And uh, that's the people whose work I have been influenced by. Uh, and with influences, sometimes you may directly see something in, in the work Sometimes not at all. Um, you know, uh, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Uh, I'm thinking about a musical reference. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's interesting who people listen to and then how they may sound, right? Um, I went to Elvin Jones's house to eat dinner one time, and uh, you know, Elvin Jones, a polyrhythmic drummer with John Coltrane. Big influence. I know, Big I know. Big influence on me when I was a drummer. I know, uh, but uh, his wife still left his CD player intact as he had it. And he had, he listened to like Louis Armstrong, uh, Sam Cooke, Trump, you know, like the things he listened to, I kind of, I guess it was a shock to me because it didn't sound like how he plays. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't listening to the things or the kinds of things yeah. that he was playing. If, certainly if you associate him with uh, John Coltrane and even with his own band afterwards. Right, right. So I would say that's what those photographers work has meant for me. 
uh, particularly Bernie Ives, like just looking at that and uh, just uh, looking at that work and then uh, re reimagining that for myself. It's almost like, you know, uh, Ray Charles didn't write George on my mind, but he certainly made it his own. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. W. Eugene Smith, I would look at his work a lot during graduate school, uh, like the, the, the long photo essays, which is something that uh, even as a nascent photographer, I had aspirations to do. You know, news can be such a turn to burn kind of thing, but I always had aspirations to do uh, a long, deep dive into something. Uh, your work, uh, I think the way you influenced me is that we have both done, uh, I like to say things is uh, like telling it like it is, you know, just taking the photo as it is more of the uh, in the tradition of documentary photography, but also we both like uh, do these constructed realities or reimagining something that's still based in truth, but we use various devices to tell that truth, particularly with your, your Birmingham project and your most recent projects that uh, it's all based in truth, but how you telling it, you know, you, you, you do different things with that. So that's, uh, I would say that's why those photographs are in there. Yeah, and certainly Rod, Rod de Kawaba was of course. Uh, a huge, one of the earliest influences of mine. Uh, as a photographer who was making work about African Americans, but also who was rethinking the way that the photographic uh, object could function in relation to the culture. Uh, you know, he wanted to make uh, these very rich, dark prints mm -hmm. that were uh, a kind of material analogy to the culture that he was photographing. This idea of blackness, you know, the blackness of the print, the blackness of the subject, the blackness of the narrative. Right. You know, Roy was the first black photographer that I encountered uh, who used the medium of photography ambitiously, who was also consciously in conversation with the history of the medium. Mm. You know, he had clearly at some point looked closely at Henry Carrier Besson's photographs, which were also important to me, and then W. Eugene Smith. You know, W. Eugene Smith would spend the whole day mm -hmm. in the dark room trying to make that one print that resonated with what he felt for the subject. And uh, he was also rigorous in terms of, as you described it, doing a deep dive into the subject. Right. Uh, yeah. So, so, so I think it's interesting that you have that here because it gives the viewer uh, a clear sense that, uh, much like the black bars themselves, actually, that were all connected to an ongoing history. Yeah. And you've made some of that history uh, visible in this section that you call influences. Right, and then it continues. We have uh, in this installation, Honey Bear's Hotspot, named in homage for my dad. We have some books, uh, but one of the books, it's uh, by Francis Wolf. And I would say that's the first photographer whose work I just was extremely enamored with, and it was because of my love of jazz and the Blue No Record label. I love that work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. My, my locker in high school was full of Downbeat magazines, <laughs> no books, but Downbeat magazines. And uh, just, I, I would say that nah, his work was probably my first big influence, and then the second big influence when I started to think about photography was Frank Stewart, also a byproduct of, of music, because I had his uh, book with Wynton Marcellus, like, 
uh, Swing Low Blues on the Road. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't think that's the title, but. Yeah, no, it's, it's a beautiful title. I can yeah. never exactly remember. Yeah, right. And Swing is in there, Swing Low something. Yeah, uh -huh. Swing swing yeah. Sweet Blues on the Road. I'm yeah. messing it up. But I remember I met him. <laughs> I met Frank. And I was like, man, all these years I thought you was white. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I, I don't know why, you know, I, you know, because I don't feel like they had an author picture in the book. And at the time, I wasn't very aware of black photography. I wasn't a photographer when I started digging into his, this book. This is very early 90s. And uh, I say that to say, like, the importance of seeing yourself. You know, I know when you went to that, Harlem exhibit, you were able to see Vander, James Vanderzee, just to see a reflection of yourself, uh, a beacon light of seeing what's possible, and then how you can continue on on that path. Yeah. But it's very important for people to see themselves. Yeah, certainly, uh, seeing those pictures of black people on the wall in a museum, the Metropolitan, uh, I wouldn't have been able to articulate it at the time, but it had everything to do with uh, the, the ultimately the ambition that I uh, set for myself, mm -hmm. you know, because prior to that, that's not the way I thought about a museum. Yeah. I, I didn't think you went to a museum until photographs of people that look like people that you knew. I mean, you went to a museum and there would be Jackson Pollock, there would be Vincent Van Gogh, there would be, you know, paintings and there would be, you know, things from the history of art, not photographs of people who look like your mother, your father, <laughs> your grandmother and people right. that you know. So that exhibition, even though interestingly enough it wasn't a fine art exhibition, uh, but the fact that it was photographed and it was black people and it was in a museum and those people were in Harlem, and my mother and father had met and lived in Harlem. At that moment, all of a sudden, the camera that I had began to make a lot more sense. Right. I hear you. Well, speaking of exhibitions, let's talk to the curator of this one, Benjamin Hickey. All right, gentlemen. All right. Well, you had some questions about the influences section. So uh, I figured what better thing to do than to let the curator kind of answer some of those things. Well, um, to, to follow up on that, the exhibition, you know, talking with Kasimu, kept being about interconnectedness and community. And we know each other through a mutual friend and friendship, in family ties or kinship ties, or however you want to phrase that connectedness, just oozes out of these photos. And so I thought it'd be really important to do that on an art historical basis um, and feature photos by artists that influence Kasimu, but then also, like, like you have a personal relationship with him, and, and I feel like to take that for granted in a solo exhibition, would uh, so much context could be lost, and so we we move forward with that paradigm, that one section of the of the exhibition. And so I, I was always curious to know, like, how do you know each other? Like, what what is it like knowing each other as artists, working in different parts of the country with slightly different subject matter, but similar at the same time? What do you gain? in terms of your connectedness in your creative or personal lives? Well, we met in Chicago. Uh, Kasimu was part of an exhibition that Chantra Patrice Lewis uh, curated, uh, the Black Dandy Project, which traveled to the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago. And uh, after the opening, I recall this young man here, who I didn't know at the time, stopped me and asked me if uh, he could make a portrait of me. So I said, sure, why not? Uh, he made the portrait of me on Michigan Avenue. 
uh, I liked the photograph. So I decided I'll continue to know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was based in New Orleans, and I had been spending uh, time in New Orleans. Uh, I knew that I would see him again. So uh, we struck up a relationship. Uh, um, quite a few years older than Kashimi, although I, I can't say exactly how old he is. I do know uh, I'm quite a few years older than him. So uh, it's been both a friendship, uh, which for me has to exist first. There has to be uh, a friendship. Uh, and then I started getting uh, FaceTime calls from him. I started getting urgent text messages from him, uh, reaching out to me whenever he had a question. Sure. Uh, because a lot of the things that one needs to know uh, to situate themselves professionally in this field and to advance in the field. They don't teach this stuff in school. Uh, so at that point, uh, it's really invaluable to have someone uh, within your community that you can reach out to who's experienced uh, those things and can pass that on to you. That was certainly true in my case too when I came in. Uh, there were artists and photographers uh, who were a few steps ahead of me and I always relied on them for the deeper questions, uh, not always and only about the work itself, but professionally, how does this whole thing work? Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, so I think uh, the idea of community uh, as an artist is really invaluable. And in my opinion, the work actually takes place inside of a conversation with that community. I know that was true for me. It was hugely important to me when I started out to meet Frank Stewart whose name keeps coming up in our conversations because we have Frank in common, and Frank was one of those people who was a few steps ahead of me. He had studied with Roy D. Carava. He had come out of Cooper Union. I hadn't even been to art school. Uh, mm. So Frank and I had that kind of relationship. Same thing with Jules Allen, who was very close to Frank and, you know, they were photographers that I respected who were a little older than me, but not so much that I couldn't consider them uh, peers, the way I couldn't consider Ward de Carava that way. His mm -hmm. work was an influence, but he was so much older that the ability to get close to Roy and ask those conversations was something that I didn't have. But the whole notion of community, for me, artists make their work inside of a conversation with their community. Well, rapport is really important. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've known about your work, I knew about it for a few years before I ever contacted you, and it took several years before this show ever came to fruition because, you know, I always feel like you have to build trust with people mm -hmm. and it's really important. And so from that standpoint, our relationship is similar in that, you know, it, it took a long time to get this to come to fruition. But speaking about things they don't teach you in school, you know, how did that process look for you um, only because like at one point, fairly close to the show opening, I asked you a question I was really nervous to ask you. 
and it was uh, what makes you feel vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And it took me, you know, in the context of putting this exhibition together, and it took me two years, <laughs> <laughs> you know, to ask that question in a way where I felt like you would have trusted me to be asking that in a like a non-judgmental way and like how can we support the work right. you know do we need to run from something do we need to go towards it right and so can you tell me about how you handled that question knowing it took years for me to feel comfortable asking you that well i, I didn't know it i didn't know about that backstory uh and plus it was uh i guess it made it easier that we were at compare la pan uh eating and drinking when you asked me that question <laughs> Yeah. Um, you need a break? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I appreciated the question, honestly, uh, because I, I don't recall being asked that. And what I appreciated about the question was uh, the safety that you provided, uh, either your approach or in your solutions just everything so you said what would make me feel vulnerable with this show and i told you doing video work and more importantly an installation but the way you really drilled down and because your background of doing several things in art uh, you just made me feel really really comfortable with that it could happen and so i appreciated that i told someone that story the other day uh, but, you know, building rapport, building trust, things you don't learn in art school, all those things are just truly important. Um, thinking about relationships, uh, one thing that just kind of came to mind is that uh, I have a, a failed career in music in the sense that, you know, I just, I decided that at some point uh, I wasn't going to be who I wanted to be in music. Like, I just don't think I had it like that. Uh, but proximity, right? Because I was, you know, I was in close proximity with Marcellus. I talk to him all the time. Uh, close proximity with Delphio and Marcellus's brother, or Nicholas Payton. What I learned is that, and other people should know this too, that you could be in proximity with someone, but you still have to do the work, you know. Uh, so those relationships are completely invaluable. So you have to have that in tandem with still doing your individual due diligence, being very rigorous at your craft. Uh, because, you know, you could brush shoulders with bad people, as in extremely talented people all the time. Uh, but if you're not doing your own work, it's, it's for not. Um, and I think the, the, the valuable thing about having someone like him is that, like he said, it's just certain questions that maybe they first of all they don't teach it in school and secondly you would have to sit through a semester if they did like it's just very pressing questions that sometimes you just ask and you find out just access to information is really good particularly from someone that you trust just like you said um, and you know throughout all my creative pursuits in life I've always been able to build community from writing uh, being in the Melodated Writers, Society, uh, Writers Alliance or uh, Podunk Writers Society, uh, music, you know, music mentorship happens a lot, you know, uh, and then now with photography. So it's something I'm very important to me. Yeah, and I think music uh, clearly has been uh, important to both of us because at some point, I also decided, I started playing drums when I was 14 years old. Um, played professionally for a time with a number of bands. But <clears throat> at some point it became apparent to me that I wasn't going to be the musician that I wanted to be that it was going to take a lot more than I was willing to commit to get to the level of rigor of the teachers that I had. Because I was very fortunate to uh, early on have had 
uh, some very good teachers. Tootie Heath, Freddie Waits, Milford Graves. Uh, and I think that even though I didn't continue the path of being a professional musician, the level of rigor that they set, mm. you know, as teachers and as musicians themselves was something that I'd like to think I brought to my own work. When, when people ask me who my formative influences are, the first one I usually mention is actually John Coltrane. Mm -hmm. Hearing Coltrane's music, uh, particularly Love Supreme, mm -hmm. was transformative for me. And if you look at the arc of Coltrane's career and how Coltrane basically reinvented the capabilities of the tennis saxophone, even as he was certainly very well rooted in the history of that music, but he kept pushing himself forward to this place that he hadn't heard, that he imagined himself uh, being at. So the rigor of my uh, teachers and the influence of music uh, continues to be really, really important to me. Uh, one, one, one other thing. Sometimes he answers, he gives me an answer to a question that I didn't know I had. <laughs> I, we, were at, we were at dinner uh, right after I got my studio, and I hadn't had a studio before. And he said, I bet you wonder what to do with it, right? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he was just saying, like, you know, it's great. First of all, having a studio elevates the work. It shows a certain level of seriousness. Secondly, it allows you to be alone with the work. And then third, when you want people over for community, it gives you that space to do that too. And I, I didn't know I had that question, but I was like, thank you. <laughs> That's really interesting. And, and, and so I have a question I didn't know I was going to ask because of something both of you said. And in my notes, while y'all were speaking before, I wrote the word bittersweet down. And both of your more recent work and is very bittersweet. It's beautiful, it's poetic. Um, but there's a, a sadness to it that, you know, it's mythologizing the past. Mm -hmm. And so I was curious, like, is that, in what component is it, uh, like, activism or finding sanctuary? Or is it something else when I see that in the work for, for each of you? Because it's an interesting parallel that I hadn't. It never even dawned on me until just now, unfortunately. I know for me, um, I do see my work as activism. Uh, well, it's aspirational because I look at with one of his uh, mentees, uh, Latoya Ruby Frazier, what she has done with her work and that being, and then just the continued relationship. So I, particularly with this project, I hope to get there to not only document, but institute some, some lasting change. Um, and just that dichotomous kind of thing of bitter and sweet is just, I think it just drives me. It's just a part of my DNA, you know. I love New Orleans, but it's a lot about it I hate. You know, uh, but even better, I am who I am because of New Orleans, but I am who I am despite New Orleans, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so you're just always going to have that juxtaposition of uh, warring emotions. Mm. Yeah, you know, I think uh, with the past few projects that I've done that have been very much about a reconsideration of or a reimagining of aspects of African American history, and of course, by extension, American history, one of the things uh, I've uh, become increasingly aware of as I've become older 
is uh, I feel uh, compelled to engage that history and to keep that history present in a contemporary conversation uh, and to find ways of doing that that makes that history resonate, uh, that makes that history feel, again, imperative. Uh, so I don't know that bittersweet is exactly the word that I would use. I hadn't even thought of it that way. It makes me want to go back to the dictionary and look up that word is exactly what the yeah. definition of bittersweet is, but I do know that I feel very much compelled to continue to engage and bring this history forward through my work into a, a contemporary conversation within the context of the kinds of places and which my work is seen. That was beautiful. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Um, <laughs> can't even pretend to have a conversation for a second. <laughs> um, but can you, you've both also, I don't know, Dawood, I don't know you for video, and you've recently started working with video. You've started working with video, and you've started doing installation components within your work. Um, where does that creative urge come from to expand into something that's unfamiliar? Like, what's, what's challenging, what's satisfying about that? I think you, you it's like, um, they say if you, it's just always a, a reaching for something. It's like, like Coltrane, continually pushing on Miles Davis, where the man changed his music, and therefore music in general, mm -hmm. so many times. You know, um, so he could have he stayed in playing Kind of Blue, one of the most popular records of all time. But his music shifted three or four times after that. So for me, Brooklyn kind of blew on the corner. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. Then bitches brew. Uh, and then to be allowed to be influenced by, uh, like he played Human Nature, Michael Jackson song. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is in the 90s. So just always being influenced, always being in conversation with other people, uh, and just like a, a pushing of sometimes you need to, to communicate something in another way. For me, that's why it's, hap it's, it's, it's refreshing to transition between various mediums, uh, be it writing or photography and, and now with the film and then installation. It's just a, it's a certain statement that uh, it affords you to make and to communicate it in a different way. Well, I think it's, uh, it gives you a way to uh, further engage the ideas and the narrative of the work uh, in yet a different form, in a form that you're less familiar with. So it presents a new challenge. Uh, and for me, uh, that challenge of having to figure out something that you don't know as well as something else. You know, for me, having made photographs for some 45 years now, uh, there are a lot of things that I know about how to make photographs. Uh, film and video, there are a lot of things that I'm still finding out. So for me, it allows me to continue to engage those ideas in a different form. And uh, much like a musician like Miles Davis, uh, it's a way for you to avoid becoming your own oldies show. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I never want to become my own oldies show. Right. I, I always want there to be something that 
the viewer hasn't necessarily anticipated. Oh wow, it's not a portrait, it's a landscape. Oh, it's not the still image, it's a video. So just to keep pushing both the conversation and the expectations and my own sense of uh, wanting to continue to push my practice forward, to push my own envelope. I have a question for you. Um, so being a, uh, being a, a white male curator mm -hmm. and uh, an overwhelmingly white space as far as museums, what has given you the vision as well as the fortitude uh, to push forward and to expand the diversity of showings uh, with artists of color, black artists, uh, and to do so in a, a largely, I would say, it's a diversity, but a largely white city. Uh, but that, it does not seem like a, uh, a Johnny Come Lately moment for you. This is seems, and you grew up in Buffalo too. So yeah. what, what has given you that to move your career uh, and move your practice in that regard? Vita Shell. Okay. So our mutual friend, um, just holding me accountable. Mm -hmm. That's it. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. And do you think? Makes do you me think? Cry in the <laughs> interview. <laughs> 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 Jerk. Right. <laughs> you know that was gonna happen. Ah, <laughs> uh, man. I'm sure Vitus. I'm sure other curators have, um, other curators I'm sure have encountered black artists who tried to hold them accountable. Uh, there's been a reckoning recently. Uh, what do you think that can continue to move that forward? Um, I think it's being careful. It's like, it's like learning the history and understanding it and trying to move that forward and incorporating more types of history. Um, my own personal history, you know, with um, and, and, and understanding that. And, you know, clearly I'm not used to being asked too many questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I feel like there the reason why I do it is, firstly, the, with the artists I show anyway, the work's really good. Mm -hmm. uh, that's always what I come back to when this type of discussion comes up, is like, is this work good? And that's oftentimes where the, uh, the conversation starts. And then if it's not, not good, like if the work is good, why aren't we showing it? and just getting it on the walls and getting it up on the walls in a variety of different ways. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, you know, like black abstraction, where an artist who doesn't care about their race, getting them in here and showing that work and not making race a, a part of that particular show's uh, discourse, but I know what I'm doing, but then honoring their intention, you know, there, there are multiple layers to it. And mm -hmm. so I'm just really interested. I'm, I'm worried about all the good work I'm missing out on if I weren't to have done that or, or start doing that. And then the other thing is to always keep pushing at it and see, mm -hmm. see what'll happen. I do not have a good answer prepared. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> I yeah. didn't have a good answer prepared, but you know, it's challenging. I don't know that much about certain parts of black art history or African American art history. Again, it's like a, even that delineation is a conversation I have to have with individual artists. Like, how do they want to yeah. do it? And so those conversations are really, really exciting. Right. Well, I think it's, uh, I think it's uh, almost time for you to bring us on home, you know. Um, like, you know, Baptist church. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I think uh, the museum, uh, to me, you know, everything that's in the museum is 
the visualization of a set of ideas. And I don't know that people uh, think about the things in the museum that way. But uh, it's really about the visualization of ideas and decisions being made about the quality of execution within the objects that embody the visualization of those ideas. So I, I enjoy being in the larger art historical conversation that museums provoke because it's my ideas, it's the ideas embedded in the exhibition, in the next gallery. There's all these ideas bouncing around in the museum. And for me, it's about uh, participating in that conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, having my work and the things that I care about, the ideas that I think about, the ideas that I try to visualize, being a part of the larger art historical and institutional conversation in a way that's very different from the gallery experience. Right. The gallery is usually one artist, one exhibition, unless it's a, a curated group show, which is not or usually the norm in the gallery. But uh, I, I enjoy the conversation that the work is uh, placed inside of when the work uh, is situated mm -hmm. in the museum. Because it's your ideas and all of the other ideas of the other objects and artists uh, kind of coexisting at one time. And people move through the museum space, you know, seeing how different ideas can be realized materially. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think the most important thing is that, uh, you know, to make work, uh, the quality of execution of which holds up to the quality of execution of anything else that is considered worthy of being in a museum to make work of the same rigor as the best objects that, you know, come to be situated. In a museum. Well, I do have one more question, uh, almost full circle. Uh, it's, I, I think it'll be easy. Um, so the rigor that you put in since the 19-year-old who took to the streets of Harlem, uh, who entered in a museum, so you have been persistent your entire 45-plus year career. Looking back at what you have accomplished, Guggenheim Fellowship, MacArthur Genius Award, uh, wonderful mentor, teacher, as obviously an artist. All these accomplishments, even though you have put in a plethora of work, are you ever surprised by what you have accomplished? I would have to say no, because it's a direct uh, outgrowth of the quality and the rigor of work that I've put in consistently and right. persistently over 45 years. Right. Uh, one can't necessarily expect it, and one doesn't work for it, but no, I'm not surprised at all. <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, thank you all. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll say one more thing. Vanishing Black Bars, Vanishing Black Bars and Lounges, will uh, remain up at the Hilliard Museum until July 30th. We have an artist talk on April 20th. Uh, you can follow me at Visions of Verbs Media, and you can follow the museum at Hilliard Museum. Uh, How do you know? Wonderful. Right, and you can follow him at <laughs> Daoud Bay. Yeah. So thank y'all.